I think we got to start off with the Iowa caucuses. Um, president Trump with a command, or former President Trump with a commanding lead. How should investors view this caucus and just the likelihood that it's going to be another showdown between Trump and Biden coming in November? Yeah, so I, you know, Trump has had a very wide lead in Iowa the whole time. Um, it's in the 30 point range. Uh, the next state, New Hampshire, it's narrowed a little bit. Nikki Haley's got had a little bit of traction, but in Iowa, he's always maintained this big lead. Now, some people think that Iowa breaks late, but 30 points, you got to think that Trump is in really strong position to win Iowa and uh, really set himself on course to win the nomination, probably wrap it up in, in effectively in, in early March, and then set up that, that showdown, the, the what I refer to as the rerun that no one wants to watch because <laughs> we're not happy with the, with the two choices. But in terms of investors, um, you know, I, I think then it comes down to what happened, you know, who wins and what happens in 25, because there's some really significant tax debates on the horizon for, for 2025, because you have so many parts of the Trump tax cuts from 2017 expiring. Right. So this is, this is, an, this is a, a consequential election for tax policy. All right, so uh, some, a lot for investors to pay attention to. Uh, we mentioned the agenda when lawmakers return from their recess. So there's two key dates, January 19th and February 2nd. They're two key funding dates. And again, we are facing the possibility of a shutdown. How should investors view this and those two dates? So one base case is that there's going to be a shutdown. Um, very little uh, progress has been made towards uh, passing uh, spending bills to avert a shutdown. So you expect the shutdown. What does that mean, though, for markets? And I think history tells us very little. Uh, we, we have markets that have uh, that have uh, declined during shutdowns. We also have markets that have rallied during shutdowns. Matter of fact, the last shutdown, which was one of, if not the longest uh, shutdown in history, 34 days, December 2018 into uh, January 2019, the market was up 10 percent. So I'm not telling investors that a shutdown means that stocks are going up. I'm just saying. It's not the factor that people think it is. So kind of keep calm, carry on, pay attention to other factors that are going on. We're going to be in earnings season. You have geopolitical events. Those are the issues that are going to, to move markets, not the shutdown. All right. So, Brian, stick around for just a minute. I want to pivot to a different story. Uh, Biden administration officials say they will reopen several southern border crossings this week, which have been closed due to a surge of migrants arriving to the U.S., the announcement coming as a group of House Republicans, led by Speaker Mike Johnson, will visit one of those crossings today in Texas. Our Emily Wilkins joins us now with much more and the message that Johnson is sending to the White House with that trip to the border. Emily, good morning. Good morning, Frank. Well, yeah, the Senate and the White House are hashing out this bipartisan border deal here in Washington. Speaker Mike Johnson is in Texas, leading a group more than, as you said, 60 Republicans to the southern border, trying to send that message to Biden. Reaching some sort of deal on border security and immigration is key to get enough Republicans to support and pass a larger foreign aid package, which includes billions of funding for Ukraine, Israel, the Indo-Pacific region. Now, President Biden initially requested more than $13 billion in funding for the border as part of that package. But Republicans have made it clear that they're only going to accept policy changes. So a number of Senate negotiators returned to D.C. last night to hash out details before Congress returns next week. Now, while Speaker Johnson hasn't been in the room for those negotiations, he is making it clear what he wants to see. Johnson called on Biden to use his executive order to implement broader changes, including ending a policy that allowed migrants to be released without a court date, restricting parole, and working with Mexico and Canada to take in those seeking asylum in the U.S. Johnson's also dealing with pressure from hardline conservatives who are threatening to not support funding the government unless stricter border security measures are implemented. In a letter, Texas Congressman Chip Roy called on the Senate to take up a wide-ranging border security bill known as H.R. 2 that House Republicans passed last year without any Democratic support. Roy said Republicans must make funding the federal government operations contingent on the president signing H.R. 2 or its equivalent. Frank, back to you. Emily, uh, before we let you go, can you give us some insight on what we're seeing from Republicans on this issue? The Senate appears willing to work with the president, the House taking a much harder line. 
We have seen the House and Senate Republicans divide on so many things, Frank. We've seen them divide on Trump. We've seen them divide on various bills. And I think immigration is just the latest fight where we're seeing this. I mean, part of it's a math problem. House Republicans don't need Democrats to pass the things they want to pass. Uh, where the Senate, you absolutely need uh, to have Democrats on board to get anything done. So Republicans in the Senate know this. That's part of the reason why they're working with the White House, uh, with uh, Secretary Mayorkas, even while House Republicans are waiting impeaching Mayorkas. So you're just seeing a huge difference here in the approach. And I think the real trick is that if the Senate does come up with an agreement, how does Speaker Johnson handle it? That's going to be a huge test for him, really pitting him against some of the hardliners in his conference who are already lining up to go against him versus, of course, just needing to get something done. All right, Emily Wilkins, live in D.C. Emily, thank you very much. Uh, turning back to Brian Gardner from Stiefel, still with us right now. Brian, I want to get your reaction. So I, I think it's interesting listening to Emily's reports. I, th I, I think she nailed the topic pretty well. But the, the issue, I think, for the White House is that it's been late to engage on the border issue, um, and it's engaging only with the Senate. And I kind of understand that. Uh, President Biden, being a former senator, he's partial to that body. But there's not been a lot of engagement, in my opinion, with House Republicans. And Senate Republicans have shown a willingness to defer to the House uh, on, on spending bills, on the border issue. And so until the White House really engages with House Republicans and get, gets a deal with them, it's going to be very difficult to get a broader deal on the border and, by extension, the supplemental. And then at the same time, you also have a, a, another faction in Congress, the progressives, who don't want those concessions. And so getting a deal on the border and, by extension, either the budget spending um, or a, a supplemental foreign aid package for Ukraine and Israel is going to be very difficult. There, there's, uh, there's a consensus in Washington, I think, that they will reach a deal. I'm okay. not as optimistic as, as a lot of folks here in town. I think, I think the negotiations are much tougher than people have acknowledged.